Uh, hey guys, uh, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, I actually grew up in Hong Kong um, before I moved to the States when I was 13, so it's really cool to actually be back in Hong Kong and actually presenting at some place uh, as cool as TEDx. So I'm gonna be talking about uh, computer vision bringing toys to life. Uh, what is toys to life? It's usually a term that's used to describe things like Skylanders or Lego Dimensions and Disney Infinity, but I think as uh, technology gets more infused into toys, that term's gonna broaden a lot more. Uh, but why is it important at all? Why is play and toys important uh, in the big scheme of things? So uh, this is me uh, many years ago, Christmas. That's the first Lego set that I could remember, um, a, a train set that uh, I got from my parents. Uh, and then this is last year. So I was at, uh, <laughs> just as excited, uh, I was at the Lego offices in Denmark. Uh, my good friend, Fraser Lovett, he took me down to the Lego vault, and it's literally a vault. It's actually underground. Um, and uh, it shows, uh, actually has all the Lego SKUs that have ever been made, like chronologically ordered. So you can actually go through and scroll through everything and find the sets that, uh, that you had as a kid. And the powerful thing was that it wasn't this just, you know, distant uh, childhood memory. It was like this visceral connection back to the toy. Like I could remember, playing with the blue tracks on, on the glass table. Uh, I can remember on the space sets, the cool little yellow windscreen or putting on the rocket engine at, at the back of it. Um, so I think that when play and toys are done right, it's like this permanent impact uh, on a kid. And of course, Lego and all the creativity that uh, it encourages as well. So, But I think it's actually getting a little bit more difficult to do nowadays. Because if you think about uh, free time for kids is shrinking, they're spending a lot of it on screens and playing video games and stuff like that. And then even if you think about choices, right? Like uh, the number of games we had on our Atari system versus right now there's like 400,000 apps, game apps that a, a kid can download. So how do you get through all that noise? Um, and I think actually technology can, can help get through that noise, right? So there's a whole bunch of stuff that you can fit into your toy. There's like sensors and CPUs and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, Oh, that's uh, US dollars, it's not Hong Kong dollars. Uh, I was gonna say, it's really expensive, and everyone's like, eh, it's not that expensive, but US dollars. So, uh, so good news number one is that you already have all this tech, it's in your pocket, it's in a smartphone. And uh, good news number two is that uh, as soon as there's an upgrade, uh, that old phone is gonna go to like little Casper over there. So he's all happy. Uh, but why computer vision? So computer vision is important because uh, it allows the phone to connect to the toy. Uh, and how it does that is that the actual camera will recognize all the features on the toy, uh, it has all the positional data, and then from there you can actually overlay like this digital um, layer on top of the physical toy. Um, and you don't need an RFID chip and you don't need to pair it over Bluetooth or anything complicated like that. So uh, I wanted to show you guys where it all started. Um, this is a prototype that we did for um, Sesame Street and Qualcomm in 2012. Uh, you can see that uh, the toys are kind of, it's like watching Sesame Street on acid or something like that, you know? Uh, not that I personally know what that means, uh, especially because my mom says she'll watch this on YouTube later, so anyways. Um, but it's done that way because the device has to be able to recognize the toy from all angles and it needs all this complex patterns to see it. So the experience looks something like this. Uh, you look at the uh, tablet, I mean the, the, plat, uh, the mat, you put on the physical toys. Hey Arnie, it's great to see you. So what we did was we actually wrapped the little toy with a slightly larger 3D animated figure on top of it so you could animate and, and, and move around it. Um, but the big step for this and the magic moment is that we're used to augmented reality being like a 2D print or looking at a magazine or a poster, and that feels very much like marketing. When you see it happening on a physical object, that, that feels like magic. Um, that was then, uh, and then this is now. So we're really lucky that uh, Lego and Toys R Us are letting us show this. So this is kind of a world premiere. Uh, this is, won't actually be public until November, uh, but this is a model box. So you'll see this in Toys R Us and Lego stores. Um, it shows all the SKUs, um, like all the, uh, the, the fun 
pieces. But if you have our app and a hairy forearm, you can actually see yeah, that the whole set come to life. So the really cool thing is that like, we can actually get the digital characters to run up the physical toy, like really interact physically. And it's just using the camera uh, on the phone. So when you guys see stuff like this, and I'm, I'm sure you're thinking like, whoa, how did he do that? I didn't do that. Uh, <laughs> all this tech is from Qualcomm, and there's this guy called Mick in Austria who's really responsible for all this stuff. So he, he did that stuff. We only do the experience on top of it. So uh, I wanted to take all these features and put it into a toy that we can develop together. So this is actually a kid testing environment. Uh, unfortunately, it's kind of like this in real life. It's a, you put the kid and a toy in a very sterile room. Uh, all the middle-aged people are on the other side of the one-way glass. And uh, we're drinking coffee and just pounding candy. Um, so here, feature number one, you can animate the character. Uh, but you can also do a lot more than that. You can also bring the whole environment and the whole story and the world of the character to life as well. So I don't know if you guys seen the movie Tomorrowland, uh, or at least the trailer, but when she picks up the pin and like, uh, she instantly transports into Tomorrowland, and as soon as she drops the pin, she's back in the real world. Uh, imagine doing that with a toy. Imagine as soon as you engage with that toy, you're suddenly surrounded like in the Star Wars universe or something like that. And then as soon as you're done playing with it, you're back in your boring, terrible room. So, um, but uh, it's hard to compete with a kid's imagination. So if you're just doing animation, that, that, that's kind of like a, uh, it's, it's a tough road because a kid is always going to imagine more than what you can script or animate or, or afford in your budget. Uh, so computer vision has to bring a lot more to the table. Um, so one thing is it can be aware of the environment. So here, we have text recognition, so this is contextual learning. It could read um, the type and stuff uh, around the room. Um, this is for McDonald's. You're actually doing, we're scanning a tabletop, and you can shoot a soccer ball against objects on the table. And it's actually the same tech that the Mars rover uh, uses to um, actually uh, go across the alien terrain and look for Matt Damon and stuff like that. <laughs> um, uh, and then the final thing is uh, uh, for Lionsgate, um, for the latest Hunger Games movie, um, it's 3D face tracking. So, um, so if you imagine all these types of capabilities into a toy, uh, and what you get is something like this. So now Ted 9000 knows who he's playing with. He knows what objects are uh, on the table and stuff like that. Uh, and if you tap him into the cloud, then he's fully aware of the history of play with that person as well. Uh, the AI is still really early development, so don't worry about that. Uh, uh, and then the other features that I'm going to show right now are from a toy um, that we're developing with Weta, uh, so out of New Zealand. Um, their designers, so the same robot designers from uh, District 9, Elysium, Chappie are actually designing our robots. Um, and we're doing the digital experience on top. So one thing that I do want to uh, comment on, and I, I think the Republicans in the room will be especially happy with this, is that uh, 2012, this is like early childhood education. And uh, 2015, we took the same technology and we weaponized it. So. <laughs> uh, um, but some of the ideas that we're playing with is um, Digital upgrades. So we're used to buying a toy, and it's basically what you get out of the box. But what if you, you buy a toy, and then over time, it can actually evolve? So digitally, it improves. When you can earn upgrades and, and, and add more pieces over time. Uh, if you apply this to TED 9000, uh, so here <laughs> we've added the Urukai war helmet onto them. Um, but the other thing you'll notice is that we have a 3D printer in the corner of the room. So you have this instant gratification of seeing the digital, digital component on the toy, and then in the background, your 3D printer can actually print the physical piece, so later on you can add it. So everyone in the room who hasn't used a 3D printer is like, whoa, five minutes later, I get the helmet, and I can put it on top of the toy. And everyone who's used a 3D printer is like, four days. <laughs> that, that thing is going to jam so many times, but yeah.
that stuff will improve as well. Uh, another thing that we're playing with is, so here we have one player moving the physical pieces on the board, and then the blue team is in another room entirely, and they move their piece, and it basically digitally moves on your piece. So imagine multiplayer, I mean, we're used to this on video games, but multiplayer with physical toys. So I could be playing here with physical pieces, and someone in Japan or uh, Africa could be moving their pieces, and I, I see it all on the same board. Uh, so we think that's going to be a game changer. So now Juliet has her little friends, friends from J uh, Japan, and then uh, her cousin uh, uh, Ava from London joining her at the tea party. And then the final piece of tech, um, we think this is closing the loop. Uh, so the idea of a, here's a physical tank. Uh, we've put an AR control system. You can tell where, it, uh, where you want it to go digitally. And then the physical tank moves through the digital environment and actually interacts with that digital environment. So closing the loop between digital, affecting physical, and then back to digital again, uh, I think is the next kind of like big magic moment uh, for uh, Toys to Life. Um, so I can't wait to see what we do with that tech when we shove it into TED 9000. So. Aw, <laughs> oh, he's going in for a hug, so sweet, <laughs> yeah. And the researchers are so excited, you know? <laughs> like sometimes when you're working on these things, you just know you have a winning concept, right? So, um, but that's now. So what's the roadmap? Uh, and the stuff that's really just around the corner, there's things like, uh, that's the uh, Google Tango, which is, um, uh, has depth sensors, kind of like connect on the back of the device, so it can really scan really well. And then there's a, a HoloLens and um, Magic Leap, which is, uh, AR with a head-mounted uh, display. So that's the next level of, of kind of like the magic moment, is when you can put it on your uh, uh, head, your hands are free, and you just see it appear on the toy, uh, that, that'll be pretty amazing. Um, and of course, the price of the components will go down as well over time. But as a counterpoint, I'm sure some people in the audience, especially parents, are like, man, there's technology everywhere, you know? Like, why don't we just Leave toys alone and let toys be toys. Um, and I wanted to bring a personal story in. Um, I was in uh, Lego uh, for the first three months of the year. I took my family uh, over. I was embedded at Lego to work on uh, digital physical play uh, in, in the future. Uh, oh, actually, that's, a, that's summer. This is Denmark in the winter. Uh, so you'll see the giant frozen Lego blocks that are scattered on the side of the road. Um, but the really cool thing was that I actually met uh, a guy there whose grandfather um, was uh, one of the original people at Lego when there were just 10 or 12 people, and he was on the accounting department or something like that. And uh, Lego used to do wooden toys uh, before it did plastic toys. So I asked this guy, I was just like, whoa, like, is your house made of Lego? Do you get to go in the corporate jet? Do you still have your first set? Uh, and where do you keep it in your house? you know, stuff like that. And he said no to all of that. He said that basically um, his grandfather left Lego. He left Lego right as it was transitioning to the brick. And the reason why he left was he didn't believe in the future of plastic. <laughs> so I think that that's something that stuck with me the whole time, like uh, that, that we really have to embrace uh, change uh, uh, and, and embrace what uh, new opportunities can, can bring. Um, and the final thing I want to leave you with is the most important reason and why this is worth doing for me. Uh, this is the most exciting time for me in, in my career. There's so much tech to play with. We're inventing things all the time. Uh, we're doing things that no one has ever been seen. Um, but the big reason why is um, uh, just the idea that if I could make something that 40 years from now, and my daughter's still talking to me after putting up the slide, you know, uh, that has kind of influenced her creativity um, and also uh, has that lasting tactile, physical in impact with her through her whole life. So thanks, everyone. Yeah.